ok, ok, ok. Let's get this sorted out. Okay, everyone, so uh, let us get back to business again, as they say. Uh, I'm not sure if this is business or pleasure, but I, I think it's uh, kind of good pleasure, pleasure which leads to really good things. It's kind of nice pleasure. So let's carry on with uh, pleasure. Uh, and one of the things that I uh, did not say, which I probably maybe should mention just very briefly, uh, is that how is it that these views arise from that improper attention? And uh, it is, you know, it's, it's fairly simple, really. If you think that uh, life is really bad and really miserable and you don't see any future for yourself, maybe your, your present isn't very good and all of these kind of things, then the, the annihilationist view can very easily arise. Yeah, myself does not exist in a an absolute sense, and you're kind of you know quite happy with that just uh, disappearing and not existing in the future. On the other hand, if you kind of if you have a fantasy about how great things are, then maybe you have more the eternalist view, the idea that things will carry on forever. Or of course, these things can also come from like uh, scientific ideas. Yeah, you you think that uh, yeah, there is no reason from a scientific point of view to think that life carries on, and this too can kind of give rise to these sort of things. So, so uh, that's uh, the, all these considerations about how I was in the past and all that, uh, that then becomes the foundation for uh, the view, eternalist view or the uh, annihilationist view. Huh? And then we come to this other little paragraph here, which is very fascinating. Yeah? The, uh, uh, the view, I perceive what is not self with the self. The view, I perceive the self with what is not self. Uh, sorry, I think I missed one there. I perceive what is not self with the self, or I perceive the self with what, what is not self, or I perceive the self with the self. Yeah, so the idea here, you can see all of these three views, uh, they have an idea of self in them, either the self uh, uh, recognizes itself, it sees itself, uh, or the self sees things that are not self, or the not self sees the self. So self, there's a self in this all the way through, yeah, and this is the problem, and this is why all of these views are basically, you know, there's a self all the way, and these are different ways in which we can uh, uh, consider the self. This, this is actually usually equivalent to what is called Sakaya Ditti in the suttas. And, and if you go, I think, to the Chula Vedala Sutta or the Mahavedala Sutta, it talks about Sakaya Ditti, Majjhima Dekaya 44. And it shows you how the sense of self can exist in relation to the five khandas. Yeah? So, for example, you have feelings, either you are the feeling or the feeling is yours, yeah, you're the owner of the feeling, or you are inside feeling, or the feeling is inside you. These are the four ways that we relate to each of the five khandas. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, this here is a shorter version of this uh, Sakaya Ditti. Sakaya Ditti gives you 20, 20 possibilities, yeah, the five khandas. Uh, and for each of the five khandas, either you are the five khanda, you are in the five kanda, the kanda is in you, or you are the owner of the kanda. These are the four ways. Yeah? So four times five, you have 20. Here we have the same thing expressed. This is exactly the same thing, but is it expressed in a different way? Yeah? You perceive the self uh, with the self. This means, for example, if you take yourself to be consciousness, yeah, I am consciousness. So, and that consciousness then perceives itself. Yeah, if I ask you, are you aware that you are conscious? You will say, yes, you are aware that you are conscious. Yeah, that is like the consciousness perceiving consciousness. And if you take that consciousness to be self, then you will say, I perceive self with self. Yeah, this is what this means. There's an aspect inside of you which you identify with. This is myself. And that, that self perceives itself, if you like. Yeah. 
and then you perceive what is not self with the self. So say that you take yourself to be consciousness, the consciousness, the awareness, the ability to be aware of anything in the world. And with that awareness, you perceive your body. Yeah, so this is my body. My body is not myself because when I die, the body will be gone. But my consciousness is eternal. My consciousness is the real me. So yay, consciousness, body, okay, doesn't matter so much. So this is you perceiving what is not self, the body, with the self. Yeah, you, you have the view that consciousness is yourself. So how you get to this. Or you perceive, perceive the self with what is not self. And this could mean, for example, that you um, use your perception. Your perception is what perceives it. And you could, for example, you could use that perception to take the will to be yourself. So if you take your will to be the self, I am the doer, I am the creator, and this is me, I enjoy doing things, getting things done. And then your perception, yeah, the perception is the sanya, one of the five aggregates, that perception perceives the doer. And then it is like what is not self, you perceive the self with what is not self. Does that make sense? It is not, it is not very important, really. It just means that these are different ways in which we relate to the idea of a self. You, know, you see it from different angles, depending on how you define the, uh, the sense of self within, your, within yourself. So there is a, there's this different angles. And the idea, the point of all of this uh, is to not have any loopholes. Uh, yeah, if you take all the five aggregates and you see them in different combinations in these ways, uh, there is no loophole left. Uh, there's a way you can find anything, uh, anywhere, which you can take as a self. That's kind of the point here. Uh. And if you look at that, those three things, yeah, if you look at them again, uh, you have, I perceive self with self. I perceive what is not self with the self. I perceive self with what is not self. You will notice there is one combination that is missing. Yeah? If you have self and not self, you can have four combination, co combinations. And the combination that is missing is, of course, I perceive not self with what is not self. Yeah, or I perceive what is not self with what is not self. Why is that missing? Because that is right view. Now. That is exactly what is happening. Yeah. So when you are, when we are perceiving now, whatever it is that you are perceiving, uh, and what you are perceiving is the five aggregates, you can perceive that you are conscious, that you are aware. Uh, you can perceive the doing aspect of yourself. Uh, you can see the perception. Yeah, you can see the text on the screen, you can see the participants here, the room that you are in, that is perception, uh, the feeling, you may have a positive feeling or negative feeling or neutral, and the body. Yeah, all of these things are things that you perceive, and you perceive that with your mental aggregates, they're the ones that enable that perception to be, ha to be happening. So the things that are not self, according to Buddhism, they perceive other things that are not self. Uh, or they perceive themselves as not self. Yeah. Now, this is the thing that is missing. Yeah. And it is missing because that is precisely right view. If that is what you saw, it would be called proper attention, wise attention, not improper attention. Yeah. All of these things here are the views that arise from improper attention. Yeah. But that is the right view. So seeing non-self uh, as non-self, yeah? seeing what is non-self, uh, uh, and with what is non-self is the right way of thinking about things. And that is how the stream enterer looks at the world. Uh, for people who are not stream enterers, there's going to be a degree to which we actually have wrong view. Yeah, we are going to see a self in there to some extent. And uh, this is a very important point uh, because it means that when you go deep in your meditation practice, uh, you are not too quick yeah, in the, that you have understood what is going on there, but you keep on investigating. Is there anything in here that I identify with? Is there anything in here that I take to be the real me? Yeah? And then you investigate that and you try to go deeper. And everything in your experience, ultimately, yeah, you should be investigated in this way to see whether it's empty, 
whether it's impermanent, whether it's non-self. Uh, and as you do that, eventually you come to the core of this whole thing, yeah, which is the insight into non-self. Uh, this is how this works. Uh, so these are the wrong views, yeah? And then you come to the really full-fledged wrong view, which is the last one here. Or you have such a view as this. Uh, this self-mind is the one who speaks and feels uh, and experiences the results of good and bad actions in the different realms. Uh, this self is permanent, everlasting, eternal, and imperishable, and will last forever and ever. And um, this is like uh, considered a like a really you know a fully fledged, if you like, eternalist view, uh, whereby you you kind of see yourself as this thing which kind of moves through samsara, moving from one life to another one. Yeah, experience the bad and good deeds that you do, but inside of you there is a core, an essence, the real self, which carry on to do samsaric existence uh, and always uh, and always being subject to your bad and good actions uh, yeah and this might be a buddhist might think about life in this way yeah because we also have that wrong view and sometimes this is how we look at these things so uh, there you are that is the uh, the problem of these uh, kind of views uh, and uh, please remember that these things are problematic. Why are they problematic? Yeah. And maybe this is a good time to discuss that a little bit, why this is problematic. Yeah. Because uh, um, the, the point yeah, with all of this, the point of a sense of self, and this is what you will have seen here to some extent, yeah. uh, I perceive what is non-self with the self. The idea here is that if you have a self, that self must have a content. Yeah, this is what it's saying here. I perceive the self with the self, or I perceive what is not self with self. You perceive something that you take to be the self. And that thing which you perceive to be the self, it only exists if it has a certain content. It has to be something. If it isn't anything, then it's not the self. So what is that thing that it is? Well, it is some aspect in you. It is the doer, it is the knower, it is certain perceptions about who you are, maybe certain feelings, and maybe you even take the body to be yourself. Yeah? All of these things can be what you take to be yourself. So once you take something to be yourself, at that moment, you have attachment. Yeah? Because that thing, which is the real you, obviously you're going to be attached to it. If someone says that I'm going to take away the real you, you're going to be upset because it is the me. This is the I. This is the real fundamental part of who I am. And if someone wants to destroy that because it is you, it is the real you, you're not going to want that. By definition, you're not going to want that. So the moment you perceive yourself to be permanent in this way, you have a problem. And the problem is that all of these things that you take to be the self, they actually are impermanent. They're going to change. They're going to turn into something else. And the moment that happens, it's going to be difficult to deal with that. Yeah, if you, you know, a very simple example of this that I like to make is that when you wake up in the morning, sometimes you wake up in the morning, you may feel a bit strange. Maybe you feel, you don't feel like, you know, oh, this morning I woke up, I don't really feel like myself. And that feeling you have when you wake up in the morning, not feeling yourself, is your idea of who you are is challenged and that is always suffering when that happens yeah and i'm sure you know what i mean when i say that so the moment you have this view i am you have a problem you're going to suffer because of that but it goes much further than that because once you have an idea of i am i have a self it doesn't stop with the five aggregates inside yeah these five aggregates inside, they want to exist, they want to be happy, they want to enjoy the world. So they don't stop with the inside, but they also go attaching to external things. Why do they go attaching to external things? Because sometimes the external things, they solidify the sense of me. Yeah, external things can be status, can be education, can be success at work, it can be relationships. And because of that status, the sense of I inside is gratified. It feels happy. It feels that it is boosted in a certain way. Yeah? 
And then we attach to those external things, to those relationships, to those qualifications, to the job or whatever it is. Uh, and it doesn't even stop there. The sense of self also, also wants to be happy. Uh, and because the sense of self wants to be happy and it doesn't know about samadhi experiences, uh, it grasps the things of the world. It holds on to the things that it thinks will make it happy. Uh, so the sense of self doesn't stay inside. It goes out into the world, attaching to things. Uh, so the moment you have the sense of self, attachment in the world has to have a consequence. The sense of self always leads to attachments. And because it leads to attachments in the world, which is inherently impermanent, inherently unreliable, inherently out of control, you're going to suffer because of that. You're going to suffer when you grasp onto relationships, people who are going to die, when you grasp onto possessions uh, that are going to be impermanent, uh, and you're going to have a problem as a consequence. Uh. So the moment you have a sense of self, uh, you have a problem. Uh, yeah, And that is what this is about. Uh, and that is why we try. We are trying here to understand the problem with these things uh, and then move in a different direction. Uh. And that is why the Buddha says here, says this is called a misconception. Uh. It's called a thicket of views. It's called the desert of views, the trick of views, the evasiveness of views, the fetter of views. Yeah, this is very powerful, isn't it? it the misconception, it is a misunderstanding reality. It's a thicket, it's something which entangles you. Yeah, a thicket is something you can't, go, can't get through. A thicket is like a dense piece of jungle, yeah, where there's kind of uh, all kind of creepers and all kind of plants everywhere, and you have to have a machete to get your way through, and you are kind of trapped by it, you know, the thicket of you. So not only are you trapped, it is also a desert. You find no satisfaction in those views. In fact, those views lead to the exact opposite of satisfaction. They lead to a continuous thirst, to continuous craving, and never being content, never being satisfied, yeah? They are a trick of views. They are an illusion. They are a mirage. They don't correspond to anything in reality. There's nothing there which underlies the sense of self. It is just a misunderstanding. And of course, if it is a trick, if it is a misconception, we grasp onto a misconception. We're going to make wrong decisions. This is like the basic idea. If you misunderstand the nature of reality, you're going to make wrong decisions on that basis. Why? Because it is always like that. If you make decisions based on what is wrong, you're going to go in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's as simple as that. This is just the, uh, the way things are. The evasiveness of views, the fetter of views, the views that tie us to samsara, it's a fetter, it's a rope with a knot on it, tying you to the round of reef, driving you on from one existence to another one, never giving you the possibility of getting off. And rebirth, suffering, dukkha happens again and again, carrying you on forward, uh, life after life, and it's very, very hard to get off because the I am is what actually is the ultimate fetter that holds you on to this existence. Uh, and it's so hard to see through this fetter of I am. Uh, the only way you can do that is that you uh, have to have, again, the word of the Buddha, yeah? to help you to get you started and to kind of get you heading in the right direction. So um, uh, it, this is all very problematic, yeah? And it's all, all very, um, very thing. And you will see that if you, uh, where we started out, it starts off with uh, talking about I am, yeah? Or I am that. And this I am and I am that, this is a, wrong attention, you know, it's unwise attention. Yeah, so even just thinking, I am already, you are in trouble. If you think I am that, uh, yeah, or I am this already, you are in trouble. And uh, I'm always surprised, sometimes you uh, see books that are maybe written by Hindu sages or whatever, and they, you know, some of them, they have a title like I am that or whatever. Uh, and Sometimes you put this, reading these books as if they might be real Dhamma. But actually, if you look at the Sutta, even the idea, I am that, is already false. Yeah, it is already wrong. 
is already leading in the wrong direction. Already you're asking for trouble. You're asking for attachment to something which actually isn't real, says the Buddha. It's a trick, it's a thicket. It is a fetter of you that drive you on in samsara and doesn't release you from suffering. And that's why the Buddha say, an uneducated ordinary person who is fettered by views is not freed from rebirth, old age and death, is not freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress. They are not freed from suffering, I say. So as long as you have these views, yeah, and especially the I am view, the I am that view, that is going to tie you down, it's going to fetter you to existence. Uh, and it is uh, uh, virtually impossible for you to uh, come out of that uh, unless, again, you encounter a Buddha, you encounter somebody who can take you by the hand and very gently show you an alternative, an alternative way of looking at the world. Uh, so this is all very interesting and it's also quite profound, yeah? But remember that these profound teachings, they also have a, a very a practical aspect. I've tried to draw out some of those practical aspects. Uh, uh, sometimes people say that the idea of non-self, it seems very scary and frightening. Yeah? But um, actually it is not very frightening at all if you think about it in the right way. And I will, give you an idea of how to think about this in the right way, non-self or emptiness, uh, so that it is not so, doesn't seem so frightening or scary. Uh, and um, I just uh, imagine, I know that many of you are going to be meditators, you enjoy your meditation practice. Uh, and one of the things that you will have noticed is that when you meditate, uh, yeah, if you have a little bit of success in your meditation, then things become peaceful. Yeah, things really calm down. You don't think so much anymore. Maybe you gain a degree of clarity of mind and all of that. Yeah? And what you find is that when the mind calms down, when you become more peaceful, how do you feel? You feel happy. Yeah, you feel really good. The mind is peaceful. Things are calm. Maybe you feel a joy even because of the calmness of the mind. It's all very marvelous and beautiful when these things happen. But uh, the interesting thing, though, about this, and yes, you are more happy, but the sense of self is reduced. Yeah, the sense of self is often solidified by the thinking process we saw before. But the less there is of the thinking process, the less sense of self there is. Yeah, and this shows you that actually giving up the sense of self actually leads to happiness. When you are peaceful, yeah, then you are more happy. When you are busy, when you have more sense of self, you're thinking about things, actually you have more dukkha. And the more peaceful you are in your meditation, the more of the sense of self you have given up as a consequence, and the more happiness you feel. So it's magical, yeah, it's beautiful. Less sense of self, more happiness, more peace, and everything is actually really, uh, really nice and really, uh, yeah, really beautiful as a consequence. So that is a way of thinking about that, which makes it feel less kind of scary, if you like. Yeah. Um, so uh, let us uh, carry on a little bit. Uh, now what we are doing is we're coming to the other side of the coin. We're going to be looking at uh, what happens if you have the educated noble disciple? Yeah, we've just been looking at the uneducated person, and now we're coming to the other side of the coin. But maybe, maybe before we carry on, let's have just five minutes of meditation, just to kind of to, to uh, reset our minds a little bit, just to get a little bit of peace and quiet. And uh, uh, so let's do that, just to chill out a little bit.
Okay. Okay, okay. So, uh, let us uh, come back to this marvelous sutta, the, uh, all the defilements. Uh, and uh, we have now seen how you attend unwisely. And now we're going to look at how you attend wisely. So, uh, uh, we'll just carry on here, but take the educated noble disciple who has seen the noble ones, uh, who is skilled and trained in the teaching of the noble ones. Uh, they have seen the good persons, yeah, or if you like the superior persons, uh, and they are skilled and trained in the teachings uh, of the good persons. They understand to which things they should pay attention. Uh, and to which things they should not pay attention. So they pay attention to things they should and don't pay attention to things that they shouldn't. Yeah, so here we have the educated noble disciple, the person who has heard the teachings of the Buddha. The noble disciple is here, the Arya Savaka. Uh, sometimes that means someone who actually is a noble one, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's a little bit unclear sometimes exactly what it means. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, something like that, someone who's at least on the path, or at least has heard the teachings. Uh, yeah, and they are skilled and trained in the teachings. They understand the teachings. They have listened to the suttas, read the suttas, contemplated the suttas. Uh, and then they have practiced accordingly. Yeah, this is uh, what the sort of person that is meant here. And uh, because of that, uh, through initially through faith, initially through confidence, uh, you understand what you should pay attention to and what you should not pay attention to. Yeah, because you have that initial confidence and understanding. And then as your understanding and knowledge and insight develops, uh, it becomes even more clear what you should pay attention to and what you should not pay attention to. And because of all that, you do actually pay attention to the things that you should, and you don't pay atten attention to the things you shouldn't. And what are the things that they don't pay attention to and they should not? They are the things that, when attention is paid to them, give rise to unarisen defilements and make arisen defilements grow. The defilements of sensual desire, desire to be reborn, and the defilement of ignorance or delusion, if you like. These are the things to which they don't pay attention and should not. Yeah, so you have the uh, enough insight, enough understanding, and you know how to keep your mind away from the things that give rise to these things. If you understand the danger. And you can see here now the desire to be reborn or the desire to be exist to, to exist uh, is very similar to the all the things that we saw just before. Yeah? Did I exist in the past? Will I exist in the future? Who am I now? What am I? How, how am I? All that is related to this desire to exist. Uh, yeah? And so you reduce that desire by just reminding yourself actually. The past is very interesting. It's so uncertain. It will disappear before I know it. Uh, yeah, we already cannot remember our past lives usually. And the future too is actually very uninteresting because more of the same, more problems, more of the same things. Uh, and then we let go of that uh, desire even to exist. Existence seems less uh, interesting to us as a consequence. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, you don't pay attention to the wrong things, yeah? And then comes, and what are the things uh, to which they do pay attention and should? They are the things that, when attention is paid to them, do not give rise to unarisen defilements, uh, and they give up the arisen defilements, uh, the defilement of sensual desire, the desire to be reborn, and ignorance. Uh, these are the things uh, to which they do not pay attention and should. Yeah, so again, the same thing again. About, yeah, probably looked at that enough. So let's move, move on to the next paragraph. And because of not paying attention to what they should not and paying attention to what they should, 
and arisen defilements don't arise and arisen defilements are given up and this is how you attend properly or attend wisely you attend this is suffering you attend this is the origin of suffering you attend this is the cessation of suffering and you attend that this is the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering the four noble truths yeah this is how you attend in the right way so this is interesting this is the opposite of attending to the idea of a self why is that well because if you instead of thinking of the aspects of your personality as something permanent if instead you look at it yeah and you see that it is impermanent then you will also realize that it is suffering it is a problem it doesn't have the attributes that you think in fact rather than being something to be enjoyed yay i was like this in the past yay i will be like this in the future or no no i was like this how terrible um, instead of thinking like that you understand that these things are inherently problematic inherently suffering especially the yay aspect of indulging in these things is really problematic yeah. so you contemplate these things and you look at them you understand that they are impermanent uh, and when you understand that they are unreliable that they cannot be controlled uh, you cannot always have them one way or another but eventually the penny drops uh, these things are suffering uh, yeah and uh, not only so one of the things that Ajahn Brahm talks about, which is quite interesting, he says that when we do the, these contemplations, instead of asking, what am I, we should ask the question, what do I take myself to be? Yeah. What is the thing that you regard as yourself? And if you make that investigation, you will find, for example, quite likely that you take your will to be yourself, because our will, we often indulge in our will, and people think of themselves as creative people, people that think of themselves as doers. And many people are very big doers in this world. They love to do things all the time, always on the go, always doing things. And so our job should be, well, if that is what I take to be myself, I should investigate it. And when you investigate this thing that you take to be yourself, you should, you should just observe it neutrally not you shouldn't investigate it to see that it is suffering you should uh, observe it neutrally and then you will see that it is unreliable you will see that it is impermanent you will see that it is not something worthy of taking to be a self and that is how these things uh, are uncovered yeah and then you understand what is the origin of suffering what is the origin of all of these things that are problematic yeah? all of these things that are impermanent uh, and then, of course, you realize that the origin of all of these things is craving, is the desire which perpetuates rebirth, that drives you on again into the future. And because of that, you can get a aversion towards craving. You realize craving is terrible. Sometimes we take craving to be ourselves. We rejoice in craving because craving makes us act in the world. We think that craving makes us seek happiness and all of these kind of things but now you realize no craving is inherently problematic it doesn't help you seek happiness at all craving by its very definition perpetuates suffering drives the round of suffering on yeah this is how you add to this proper attention not only do you understand that i am and that's why i am is a problem because i am leads to craving you crave for these things that you take to be me yeah this is one of the reasons why it is problematic and it, then it drives this round which always leads to more suffering more rebirth so the cessation of suffering then comes from giving up the idea i am with that idea of i am i exist being given up then a craving also stops because craving is really driven by the idea of i am once there's nothing here that you are interested in anymore which is truly yours or you can hold on to there is nothing to be craved all the things that you used to crave for you realize are actually suffering they are problematic and as part of this process as you go through this insight you also understand the practice that leads to the cessation it becomes obvious to you because you understand that to be able to see clearly you need to have a very peaceful and still mind and that peaceful and still mind it comes through 
living well through morality, through giving up the world and through going inside that, you see how all of these things are connected together. You understand how the Noble Eightfold Path works. The Noble Eightfold Path is the path of purity, is the gradual purification, starting out with the right view, leading from purity to calm, to insight, to samatha and samadhi, and all of these things. And from that, it allows you then to have the insight into this whole thing. And then you have the cessation of suffering. And of course, this happens. It happens when you become a stream entry. And that is when these things kind of fall into place. So um, uh, what happens when you become a stream entry? Well, what happens, it says here, and as they do so, as you attend wisely, you give up three fetters. What are these three fetters? They are identity view, they are doubt, and they are the apprehension of precepts and observances. And you will know that these are often called the three lower fetters. I mentioned identity view before. This is a Sakaya Ditti, and it's very similar to what we saw before. The idea of seeing a self with what is non-self, seeing a non-self with what is self, and seeing a, what we take to be a self as self. You know, it is all that is Sakaya Ditti. So that gets given up. We don't see a self anymore in these five kandas. You understand that they are empty. You don't. Uh, and see any truly existing identity within those five kandas. There's nothing there to be grasped. It's all empty. That is the fetter that is given up. The identity view, you yeah, know, fetter is actually given up at that particular point. Uh, you don't have the view that there is an inherent identity inside. Uh, sakaya ditti, ditti is view. Sakaya literally means the existing body, uh, but body here means. Uh, body in the broader sense of the entire personality, in other words, the entire five factors. And you know, that is what is meant here by uh, 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 Sakaya, yeah, the existing body. And that is the view that is given up. So one of the ways of knowing that you are a symmetry is because that you have no identity anymore. You've gone beyond identity. You don't have that view anymore, yeah, that you exist in any uh, complete or permanent sense. sense, sense. Doubt is given up. This is uh, Vichikicha, and uh, Vichikicha is the doubt of understanding. Uh, you doubt what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. Unwhol you are not clear about what is um, good and what is bad in this world. Uh, yeah. Uh, for example, so the uh, idea there is that we. Achan, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay, so there we are, back again. Okay. <laughs> um, so doubt in the sutta is always defined as doubt about what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. Yeah. So you, once you have this view, once you understand where suffering lies, and once you have seen the or origin of that suffering, then also by definition, you know what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. You know what drives you towards more suffering and what does not, yeah? You have, it's very clear, it becomes absolutely clear to you what it, it is that you have to do to be able to head in the right direction. And uh, this whole thing starts, started off by saying that right view is the right seeing about wise attention and unwise attention, yeah? You don't have any doubt about that anymore. That's part of the idea of attending wisely is because you know exactly what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, where suffering is and where happiness is. So you don't have any doubt, you cannot have a doubt anymore because now you know where suffering lies and where happiness lies. But more in another way, you also understand what teachings are wholesome and what teachings are unwholesome. You know that uh, the Buddha, 
uh, Buddhist teachings are wholesome because they point to the same things that you have seen, yeah, what, what you have understood. Uh, so you are uh, aware of that, uh, and you don't have any doubt that teachings that are not equivalent to the Buddhist teachings, they cannot really be right, uh, because they are based on some of the wrong views uh, that you find, for example, what we have seen today, the idea of I exist permanently, and these kind of things. Uh, and then we have the last of the three factors, which is here called misapprehension of precepts and observances. Uh, but really, it should really just read apprehension of precepts and observances. I don't really agree with uh, uh, Ajahn Sujato's translation in this case. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, idea is that, of course, that as long as we are uh, as long as we are not noble ones, as long as we haven't internalized these teachings, uh, we have to grasp the precepts a little bit. We have to grasp onto our meditation practice a little bit. Uh, because if we don't grasp onto it a little bit, uh, we're not going to be keeping them. Yeah, it is so easy to give up the precepts if it gets difficult or whatever. So a little bit of grasping onto the wholesome things of the world uh, is actually a very posit positive thing. It is something that we should do. But once you become a stream enter, then because you have understood where suffering lies, because you always want, you're always leaning in the right direction. So you will never break a precept because you understand breaking precepts is just suffering, you're just causing problems for yourself. Why on earth would you cause problems for yourself? So you don't need to grasp onto these things. You can let them go, you can just allow it to be. You still do them, but you do them naturally because it's part of who you are. Yeah, this is a, an important part of this uh, idea of the uh, precepts and observances. So these are called the defilements that should be given up by seeing. So um, I think that is uh, uh, enough with uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, this particular part of the sutta the defilements that need to be given up by seeing and yeah seeing here means the uh, maybe insight would be a better word because this really is about insight uh, is about understanding the four noble truths uh, and uh, that is what uh, uh, what this particular part of the path is about uh, so i hope you are not uh, put off by this if you find, find this too complicated or too difficult. Uh, I hope I have been able to present this in a way that makes it uh, understandable. I mean, I have been contemplating this for 25, almost 30 years. Uh, so obviously I have a uh, you know, little bit of understanding after all of those years. Uh, and hopefully you, can, you too can kind of move a little bit in that direction. Uh, before I move on, I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of properly attending this is suffering. I, I mentioned this before, but I think this is a very important point, uh, that uh, the proper attention to this is suffering, it starts with very basic things, yeah, very simple things uh, about understanding that being immoral, not being kind, actually you are creating suffering. It is really problematic, yeah? So the initial proper attention is to understand very simple things like why acting in a bad way, why that is problematic, why it causes suffering for yourself. And the more deeply you can grasp that, that this actually is suffering, you're going to give up being immoral. You become a far more moral and kind person if you understand the power of this. Yeah, every time you do something wrong, every time you do something which is not kind towards other which is even unkind there is one person you are letting down and that person is you you're letting yourself down remember that beautiful teaching that the buddha has he is talking to the king pasenadi or kosala and the king pasenadi or kosala he comes to the buddha and he says to the buddha he says those people in the world who are treat other people badly they are like as if they are their own enemies and those people in the world who treat other people with kindness they are their own friends 
Yeah, it's a very beautiful saying. And it's very obvious when you think about it, why that is the case. Because if you treat other people badly, you are going to have to reap the consequences of that. You're going to feel bad about yourself in this life. You're going to have to carry on that negative feeling about yourself also in future lives. Yeah. So because of that, every time you do something bad towards others, the person who you're really acting badly towards is actually yourself. And you are being far worse to yourself than to the other person, because the other person, maybe they will feel your badness in a very short time, but you are going to keep on suffering because of your bad conduct for a very long time into the future. You're dragging yourself down. You're making your mind more dark, more uh, less energetic, pulling yourself down by uh, acting in the wrong way. So if you understand the power of immorality, the problem with immorality and the power of kindness, you would never do anything wrong. You would never treat anyone in a bad way. You would always be leaning in the, in the right direction. Why? Because you don't want to be your own enemy. You want to be your own friend. Every time you treat other people with kindness, you are being your own friend. Why? Because you are the one who is going to be the greatest beneficiary of treating other people with kindness, because you will feel good about yourself. Sometimes it can be hard to spot, yeah, because it can, these can be very subtle things, and you may not be able to spot it, but these things kind of up over time. But the reality is, if you can watch your mind very carefully, you will be able to see that every time you treat other people with kindness, you are lifting yourself up, making your mind more bright, being your own friend. Why not be your own friend? Why not be kind to yourself? Yeah? When you're kind to yourself, when you are your own friend, then uh, you are, are, that is what we all want to be. You know, we all want to be happy, so why not do that? Why not uh, uh, have that kind of meta for yourself, the love for yourself, uh, where you treat yourself as a friend rather than being hard on yourself and treating yourself as an enemy. Yeah? So please keep that in mind, yeah? Be your own friend in this world. So reflect on that. The more you reflect on that, the more kindness you will have in your heart. Every time you think, every time you act, every time you speak, you will start to come from kindness rather than coming from uh, the opposite. And it will become something, something very powerful on the spiritual life. It will lift you up. Uh, move you forward and make your spiritual life so much more powerful as a consequence. So this is the first way to attend on them. This is suffering, yeah, understanding morality. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, you can uh, to take that one step further, and I will show you later on how this works, uh, is to attend in a way that, uh, in a broader way, yeah, on the whole world, yeah, we're going from so far, I talked about sila, about morality. Now I want to move on to meditation again. And the way to help you into meditation is to understand that those things that block you from entering meditation, they too are suffering. Yeah. What are the things that block you from meditation? The main thing is the attachment to the sensory world. Yeah, All the things outside, because our mind goes out into the world. I talked yesterday about the idea of asava, meaning an outflowing of the mind, the mind going into the world, yeah? And as long as the mind goes into the world, the mind cannot stay inside and be peaceful at the same time. These are opposite directions. Either you go into the world outside or you stay within. You cannot do both at the same time. So to be able to do that, you have to let go of the external things. You have to understand that this is blocking you from real happiness, real contentment. Any of you who have had a little bit of a depth of meditation in your practice, and I know some of you have, yeah, some of you have been doing this for a long time and you've had some very good results sometimes. Uh, remember that that satisfaction, that happiness, is usually far superior to anything you can find in the world. Uh, so let the world be here. Uh, remember the inherent pro problems of the world. Remember the instability of the world outside, uh, yeah? I'm sitting here now in this little room. This is our little uh, studio at Bodhinyana Monastery where we do this live streaming these days. And it's very nice. Yeah, it's like a, uh, it's a, I, when I look through the window, I can see the forest 
is outside. It's a beautiful day in Perth. The sky is blue, the sun is shining. It's a little bit cold, perhaps, but it's just in many ways, it's very, very beautiful. But then when I see the beauty, I also remind myself of the impermanence. How is this, how long is this forest going to last? How is the forest going to change? How is this room that I'm in, which is very, uh, very adequate, how is that going to change? How long is it going to last? Is this building already starting to fall apart? Yes, probably. If I hold on to any of these things, I will suffer. Yeah? They said that Western Australia is one of the first places that will become a desert when climate change becomes a bit stronger. And we're already seeing that the, the, uh, the drought here becoming quite bad, yeah? Less rainfall uh, year after year. But in our monastery, it's already falling apart. The buildings are gradually falling apart. Uh, Ajahn Brahm is getting older and also a little bit fatter, fatter and older, yeah? And how long is Ajahn Brahm going to last? Uh, how long am I going to last? My body too is kind of falling apart gradually. Uh, it is very obvious if you know me for a long time, you will have notice that, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't really need to look at myself in the mirror to see that, it's very, very obvious. Uh, how long are these things going to last? Uh, and uh, the more you look at that external world and you see whatever you hold on to that in that world, uh, whether it is the uh, beauty around you, your house, your home, your family, your body, whatever it is, uh, it is always going to let you down. Uh, and then you let go. Uh, you start to leave that out because to understand the problematic and exactly those things that are problematic in that world are exactly the same things that, that stop you from attaining meditation, attaining peace, attaining samadhi. So you turn away from that, then you allow the mind to go within, to go inside, to become peaceful because you no longer have attachment to the external world. Not only do you allow the external world to fade away, but you actually allow the very ability to experience the five senses you allow that to fade away you don't need to see anymore you don't need to hear anymore you don't need to feel the body anymore all of that you can let go of that and when you can let go of those things 100 percent that is where samadhi becomes possible so you properly attend this is suffering the five senses the objects are inherently problematic that allows you to go inside and then in the final analysis, you attend this is suffering, yeah? All the five khandhas, the idea of I am itself is problematic. There is nothing in these five khandhas worth holding on to. There's no I am in there. There's all this uh, eternal impermanence and unreliability. And then you can let go of the whole thing through the kind of contemplations we have been looking at now. And that is how we gradually uncover and you unravel this idea of uh, suffering. You attend properly. You attend properly, stage by stage, and gradually developing yourself in the right way. So I hope you are following me. I hope I'm making sense. I'm always making sense to myself. You know what it's like when you talk to yourself, you're always uh, sitting here in this little studio, and I think I'm making sense. But uh, I'm not, I hope you are able to follow me as well. And if not, then I apologize. It is just my defects as a teacher that I cannot be clear enough, but uh, reflect on it, yeah? Contemplate it and then uh, see how you go, okay? So great, uh, see how you go. And then hopefully over time, you will be able to uh, uh, gain some insight into these things. Remember, this is all gradual. And it takes time to really understand some of these things. It depends on how far on the path you are and how far you have gone and how much you have done before. But uh, gradually, gradually, you will start to understand these things. So, so uh, we have a few minutes left. And um, the next sutta that I have is actually very interesting, but um, it is a little bit profound, and I don't think I have the mental capacity right now to do anything more profound. So I'm just going to leave that next sutta, leave that aside, and I'm going to go down to the sutta after that. So, uh, Yen, if you can please go down to the sutta after.
Um, the further down, yeah, go down to the sutta, which is called Old Age. Yeah, that's the one. Great. Okay, I'm glad you have made such a good system out of this. You can just click and bang, you go straight there. So well done. That's really that's really nice. So, so this is a little bit more simple. Yeah, and uh, right now I feel like doing simple things because my I think my mind is getting a little, little bit fried. And you know what it's like when you do things for too long and you can't really think clearly anymore. So I will just do a few simple things, and then tomorrow, when I hopefully have a bit more energy, I will be able to go through the more deeper aspects of the next sutta. So many deep suttas on this retreat. I hope you hope you're okay with that. Time. Anyway, this one is from the uh, connected discourses of the Buddha again, SN Sangyutta Nikaya, the first chapter, the Devata uh, Sangyutta, and Sutta number 51, and it is called Old Age, Jara Sutta. So the Devata comes to the Buddha and he asks this question, or she asks this question. question what is good? until old age. What is good when established? What is the precious gem of humans? What is hard for thieves to steal? And the Buddha replies, virtue is good until old age. Faith or confidence is good when established. Wisdom is the, is the precious gem of humans. Merit is hard for thieves to steal. And, and I, the reason I have added these little verses is because simply because I find them inspiring and uplifting. <clears throat> and sometimes they may not add all that much, but they just give an alternative viewpoint. Yeah, a viewpoint that is. Uh, uh, more emotional, perhaps more intuitive, where you can kind of intuit the feeling of the Dhamma. Yeah, and this is really what this is about. Uh, so, what is good until old age? Virtue is good until old age. So, what is the meaning of that? Uh, and uh, there's, a number, there's probably a couple of ways to understand this. Uh, yeah, and one is the fact that if you are virtuous, uh, you carry that virtue with you until you are old, yeah? And uh, if you have virtue when you are old, you will tend to feel good about yourself because even though the body becomes old, the mind always is always separate from the body and the mind can always be youthful. And that youthfulness of the mind happens when it is bright, it is buoyant, it is light, it is energetic. And that energy comes through First and foremost, through virtue, through sila. Sila is a thing which uh, uh, upholds all the good qualities inside of you. Uh, yeah, so can you be virtuous now? The older you get, the more you bring that virtue with you. And those of you are, who are already getting old, you will know that it is because you acted well when you were young. That is in part why you can now have an old age, which is less burdensome, which is more happy which is more joyful, yeah? Virtue is good until old age. It carries you with you. And even if the body falls apart, you have something inside of you that you can fall back upon. And what a wonderful thing that is. But uh, there is another way in which virtue is good until old age. And that is that regardless of how old you are, yeah, even when you get so old, you can, cannot really get anymore. You cannot walk or get around or you can, maybe you can't even take part in Zoom, but, but uh, you have to get very old before you can't take part in Zoom retreats. But uh, the point is you can always be kind yeah, to other people. You can always be kind in the way you speak to them. Uh, you can always be kind in the way you think about others. Uh, and in this sense, virtue is always there. It's always something that you, that you can practice uh, even when you get old. You can bring it with you into the old age. Uh, and if you have that virtue and you practice that when you're older, then you will also be able to practice meditation when you're older. Nothing is better than being really the body falling apart. Uh, but instead of wasting that old age, you can lie down on your bed and you can just go into deep meditation because you have uh, practiced the virtue beforehand and you're also practicing as you get older. So all of these things uh, come together very beautifully here. 
faith, uh, what, what is good when established, faith is good when established. Yeah? Uh, the idea of establishing faith, faith becomes a, a, the more you read the suttas, the more you contemplate this, the more faith tends to be established because you see the wisdom of the Buddha, you understand what is go going on. Hopefully, hopefully you understand what is going on. And if not, then, uh, then uh, well, you, uh, you know, keep on going anyway and see what happens. Uh, and uh, so you establish that faith, yeah? And, and uh, when faith is really strong, it becomes like a force in your life. Uh, it becomes like a wisdom. It becomes something that you carry with you wherever you go. Uh, and uh, you use that to encourage yourself to uh, keep on doing the right thing. The more powerful your confidence in these teachings are, uh, the more ability you will have to always live well, to think right about other people, to be wise in difficult situations, to go on meditation retreats, uh, and to enjoy the peace and calm, and all of these kinds of things. Uh, so establish that faith, then. Let that be like a a right view at the back of your mind that you carry with you. Remember that in Buddhism, the idea of right view and faith and wisdom. These things are very interlinked with each other. You cannot really pull them apart. Yeah? When faith is established, then also a sense of right view is established because you bring all the right view of the suttas, you bring that with you because you have confidence in those things. And this enables you to navigate the world if you have no faith, if you have no confidence in suitable teachings, it is like being in a desert. There's nothing there to nourish you. There's nothing there to remind you of what is important. There's nothing to find joy in. If you have faith in the Buddha, Dhamma Sangha, you can have joy that you have a, the Buddha as your teacher. Yeah, this marvelous person, the greatest spiritual genius in human history, is your teacher. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous to have a teacher who is so extraordinary as the Buddha? Man? And uh, this is really worthwhile reflecting on, the fact that you have the Buddha as your teacher. Man. But the Buddha taught this suttas and two and a half thousand years ago. Remember, he thought about people also in the present age. The Buddha wasn't just concerned with the people right in front of him. Man. He was concerned with everyone, regardless of society, regardless of culture, regardless of gender, regardless of whether you're poor or wealthy, or whether you are educated or uneducated, regardless of whether you lived two and a half thousand years ago, or whether you live now, or whether maybe you even live in the future. This is your teacher. The Buddha, when you read the suttas, he's talking directly to you. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And the Buddha, who is the Buddha? The Buddha is the greatest spiritual genius who has ever existed. The Buddha is this astonishing person who had the full, the most profound insight into happiness and suffering of human beings. Isn't that amazing to have a teacher like that? Most teachers, what do they teach us? They teach us how to write, they teach us mathematics, they teach us science, they teach us geography and history and what have you. And all of these things are very useful. But if you can go to the very core of things, if you can go to the very essence of human happiness and suffering, that is the highest teaching you can get from anyone in the world. Why? Because that is ultimately, that is exactly what we all want. So you have faith in something remarkable, and then you have this Dhamma, yeah, which comes with that, these beautiful teachings of the Buddha, that speaks to the heart of human beings, to each one of us, uh, and opens up this path, this marvelous path, uh, that gradually, stage by stage, takes you towards happiness. Uh, and then you have all the Kalyanamittas, you have the Sangha, you have uh, the Aryas that are still around in the world in the present day. Uh, and what a wonderful thing it is to have, have these uh, noble ones, uh, the Kalyanamittas, the spiritual friendship of the people at the BGF or wherever it is that you come from, uh, who come together and support you. Uh, and this faith, if you think about these things in this way, uh, becomes something very powerful, something that you can use uh, in, your, uh, in your life, something that gives you joy, yeah, that you have found this gem of the Buddhism uh, to support you in your practice and to help you forward uh, and to make your life better stage by stage. Uh, Less and less suffering, 
more and more happiness, more and more contentment. So faith is good when established, yeah? Keep on building up that faith, that confidence. Keep on coming back to the suttas, understanding what they are about. And then gradually it builds up when you see that it is true, when you practice accordingly, it becomes very powerful as a consequence. Then we have wisdom is the precious gem of humans, yeah? The Buddha says in so many places that wisdom is the highest of all the spiritual qualities. Because when you have wisdom, when you see things clearly, when you understand how things work, all the other spiritual qualities, they fall in under that wisdom. You gain the faith, you gain the sati, the mindfulness, and even the samadhi comes from that. So wisdom is the highest, the most precious thing. And all the other qualities come as a consequence. If you are truly wise, you will go into meditation so fast. Why is that? Well, simply because if you're truly wise, you know exactly where to look for happiness. And you will not look for happiness in the external world. You give up the external world and you go into samadhi very easily. So if someone gains samadhi very easily, you know that they are a very wise person. So wisdom is a very precious gem of humans. Read the suttas, they are full of wisdom, yeah? This is where you can get the starting point of these things and then develop it from there and build up your understanding of reality. And in, in the, uh, most importantly, make it um, your wisdom, uh, yeah? make it something that is yours uh, in the sense of apply these teachings in your own life and try to see the world as if you are seeing through, in a sense, as if you are seeing through the eyes of the Buddha himself. Uh, and the last one, merit is hard for thieves to steal. And this is just such a beautiful reminder to think that all the things that you own in this life, all of those things, they have to disappear. You cannot carry them with you. And there's only one thing that you can carry with you in this life. And that is the merit. It is the good qualities that you have built up in this life. Yeah, they are the ones that you will take with you into the future. Nobody can take that from you. Nobody can steal this. And this is then uh, becomes the real ownership. If there's one thing that we own in this world, it is the merit, uh, the good power that we create. Uh, and that is what we take with us. Remember the Buddha always says that uh, uh, kamma, you are the owner of your kamma. Yeah, everything else he says is borrowed goods. But there's one thing we own. What is that? The kamma. Kamma here is just another way of saying merit. Merit here is punya, but uh, punya, of course, is built up through all the good actions of karma. So, um, there we are. We have uh, come to the end of uh, this session. So, uh, I think that is a ideal place to stop. Uh, and then tomorrow we can carry on with the suttas. Uh, Let's have another break, have a break for a half an hour or so. So we come back again at 3.30 and then we will have the Q&A session at 3.30. So have a nice cup of tea or whatever you like or a snack or whatever. And then we'll see you around again at 3.30 this afternoon.